Well, it looks like you've met the deadline for stage two of your submissions. I have a stack of them to look over here. Great job on that. Uh, the next phase for the project, stage three, is going to be starting to represent the surface and the pipe network in the model. And so it will be uh, building the data that you've already summarized into uh, StormCAD. And uh, meanwhile, as you begin doing that, I'll work to track down any data sources that you need in order to complete the pipe network representation. Remember that as far as the surface goes, that's sort of your responsibility to gather the data and make estimates on which areas contribute to what inlets in the system. But for the pipe network, hopefully Huntington Sanitary Board has construction data on anything that isn't already translated into GIS. So I'll get back to you on that. Uh, homework five, which is related to precipitation, will be due on Thursday. Yeah, good mom. I don't understand your question. I still don't know. Maybe you can ask me after class what you're referring to. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so today what I'm going to do is uh, show you a quick demonstration on how you can delineate watersheds using GIS data. Um, just, you know, to contrast the method that you went through with Google Earth Pro, and then we're going to continue our discussion of precipitation. So the reason I asked you to use the computers is not for the watershed delineation demonstration. Uh, it's for something else that we're going to be doing later. But um, just because it's simple, I thought I'd show you. No, it's not installed here. All right, just one second. All right. Um, an IDF curve, or sometimes it's called a DDF curve, it, it can either be expressed in terms of intensity or in terms of depth. So when it's IDF, that means intensity, duration, frequency. Um, in the other way of looking at it, it's depth, duration, frequency. And so over on the y-axis, instead of being rainfall intensity, would be rainfall depth. But you can see that this curve is showing for a certain return period. Each one of these curves is a different return period, the two-year storm, five-year, ten-year, and so on. So for whatever return period you're interested in, you use a different curve. And the storm duration is on the x-axis. And if you wanted to know what would be the rainfall intensity for a one-hour duration, 10-year return period, let's see, one-hour duration, 10-year return period, and then you go over sideways, it would be about 1.7 inches per hour. And that's how you use an IDF curve, and you've just been through the process of, uh, of generating an IDF curve. Uh, the United States has a lot of rain gauges, but the density of rain gauges isn't nearly the same as some other countries. You can see that uh, on average the United States has uh, about 0 .002, 0 .001 gauges per square kilometer. Uh, but there are some other countries like the United Kingdom or Israel where they have, you know, an order of magnitude more gauges. The question is, how many gauges do you need and what additional uh, accuracy are you going to be able to get from that? Uh, this figure from the text shows that uh, the more gauges you have and the longer the period of record, the variance decreases, that you don't have to correct the data or you can expect the 90% uh, the confidence interval to be a narrower range when you've got more gauges. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the gauges that we have are either only, have only been online for a few years or um, they're no longer operational and so the quality of data isn't likely to improve in the future. Um, this figure is illustrating that um, if you have a lot more gauges for a certain area as the, if you only have one gauge to represent an area, then your variance is going to be 1.0. So that means that there's not going to be any relationship between the data that you're gathering and the uh, 
the actual data for a, sp a certain area. But the, as the number of stream, uh, the number of precipitation gauges increases, then the variance decreases. But uh, the reason why we don't have just rainfall gauges everywhere is that the cost is very high. And what you want to be on this curve of increasing cost and the precision is improving, the error decreasing. The more you spend, the better your precision is, but uh, sometimes that extra precision isn't worth the extra cost. One of the concepts covered in our chapter is uh, talking about maximum precipitation amounts. And this figure is showing the record storms for different storm durations, uh, the rainfall amount that had occurred. And you can see that, um, for example, uh, in India, there was a storm that lasted two years of very wet weather. And the rainfall amount in terms of inches was uh, about 1,400 inches of precipitation. And this is all the same spot, you know, this same location in India, not because it's um, consistently really wet there, but this was all uh, one event that took many different records. Um, and um, maximum precipitation amount seem to follow a, a trend that if you plot it on a logarithmic scale can be modeled. Um, but it gives rise to the concept of probable maximum precipitation. And there's an actual physical limitation on how much it can rain in a certain area based on the amount of water that can be held by the atmosphere and the size of the area and how long a storm can uh, loiter over a certain area. You think about if the storm isn't moving, then when it rains, the air is going to basically lose its moisture, and then the storm event is over. But if a storm is moving, then it's not going to just rain over one area. It's going to rain over a wide area. And so that's why there are physical limitations on how much it can rain in a certain spot, is that either the storm isn't moving and it runs out of moisture in the air packets that are over that particular area, or uh, if the storm is moving over a larger area, then the rainfall is distributed. And um, here is uh, an idea of, in the United States, some of the uh, maximum precipitation uh, depths that can be anticipated based on the area of the watershed. And so if, for example, you are counting on a watershed area that's 100 square miles, and you have a storm duration of six hours, then you may see, as a maximum, 19.6 inches of rain during that six hours. And that's, that's an incredible amount. I mean, these are maximum storm amounts. Here in West Virginia, for example, our annual average in Huntington is about 40 inches per year. And so what this is saying is that if you had a 100 square mile watershed, you might see 20 inches in six hours. But that would be like, ever in the entire history of the earth. You know, like there could not be more, more rainfall than that over a 100 square mile area. But the trend that you need to see is that as the area increases, then the maximum storm depth decreases. Because uh, there can be very isolated, a, a small concentration, a, a storm with a very high intensity over a small area. But over a large area, it's not physically possible for there to be uh, the, the transport of water over such a wide area. And so one of the trends is decreasing precipitation maximum amounts as the uh, watershed area increases. And then you can also see that the duration, the increasing duration is going to uh, increase the storm amount, but the intensities seem to be decreasing. Like between a six hour and a 12 hour storm, it's not double, it's much less than double even though the, uh, the duration is doubled. And so it's that same trend of uh, the intensity can only keep up for a short amount of time. And here's another way of representing this effect, that uh, if you have a very large drainage area, then that means you have to have a longer storm duration, and that leads to a lower storm intensity. If we go back to intensity duration frequency curves, the IDF table, you'll notice that for a long duration, the storm intensity is lower. You only have a high intensity of a storm for a short duration storm, because basically the cloud, um, it, 
the, the precipitation removes the excess pre uh, saturation of moisture in the air and the storm event is over. And so the only way a storm can last for a long time is if the intensity is low. So if we extend that concept into watershed area, what this figure is showing is that if you have a large drainage area, then you can expect the design storm duration to be longer. And so inside of this window is the typical range relationship between drainage area and design storm duration. But the, the general trend of upward and to the right shows that as drainage area increases, so does the design storm duration. And that's why, that's the why behind the trends that we see here of larger areas lead to lower maximum observed uh, precipitation amounts. Um, another important trend is uh, which is related, uh, of spatial distribution shows that uh, if you have a watershed area that's very large, there may be some parts within the watershed that has uh, a, a variation. The aerial average of rainfall is a percentage of the point um, measurement. And so let me draw here on the board the difference between an aerial average and a point measurement. So let's say we've got some watershed and we're measuring it just at a single point. We, here's our rain gauge. What this figure, the, the concept that this figure is trying to illustrate is that <clears throat> if you have a relatively small area, so let's say if we've got a 50 square mile area, um, over the entire area, it may be 70% of the water of the precipitation amount for the aerial average compared to the point. But if you have a uh, for a, a storm that lasts 30 minutes, but for a watershed area that's 100 square miles, it would be 60%. So that would mean if you have a small watershed. compared to a much larger watershed, the large watershed is worse off in terms of trying to accurately model the average for the whole area with one rain gauge. So for the large watershed, you had only 60% of the precipitation in the entire area, whereas in the, small, the smaller watershed, it was 70%. So there's less variation between the point and the area if the watershed is small. The bigger the watershed gets, the more inadequate it is to try and um, model how much precipitation there was just with a single gauge. And you remember that we did the in-class ex exercise with the Thiessen method where you're taking lots of different rain gauges and you're trying to come up with an average for the watershed with many different points. This is showing, number one, the, uh, the percent difference between a single point measurement and uh, the precipitation for the entire average, uh, aerial average. And then the other thing is the storm duration. And what this is showing is that uh, if there is a long storm, there's more averaging. And so a storm that lasts 24 hours, the point measurement relative to the area measurement is going to be more accurate because as the cloud is moving over the point, um, if it's lasting for a long time, that's going to mean that it's a relatively low intensity storm. And so it'll be the same amount of precipitation in the lower part of the watershed as the upper part of the watershed and inside the rain gauge. And so a storm that lasts a long time is not going to just sort of have a super high intensity at one spot, but not the rest of the watershed. And so that's another important trend that Chris. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is how those curves are generated. Yeah. Um, and so it's important to know uh, sort of the trends of why the, uh, the temporal distributions that we see of having uh, greater intensity for a short duration and how that relates to watershed size and you know, this figure kind of sums that up. Uh, here's a map that illustrates the different rainfall distributions that in the exercise we just did where it was a type 2 distribution. You know, we're here in West Virginia. All of West Virginia is in the type 2 region. Most of the country is type 2. But there are uh, coastal rainfall distributions that are a lot more 
uh, steady. If you look at our type 2 distribution had this part that it was very steep, meaning that there's a high intensity of, at about the 12 hour mark. The intensity is very high. But in California, Oregon, Washington, there's type 1 and type 1A where um, it doesn't have as steep a rainfall amount. And particularly in the northern coastal areas, you'll notice that type 1A just really doesn't have a prolonged period of high intensity. Type 1 kind of does, but type 1A really doesn't. Uh, and then type 3 is coastal areas in the Gulf and down in Florida, uh, the eastern seaboard, so uh, where tropical storms dominate. And this, the SCS rainfall distribution is a way of synthesizing a rainfall hydrograph where we may only have uh, rainfall measurements at 24-hour in intervals. So we went through that process of applying the SCS distribution. Um, we are out of time for today, so let's just jump up to these announcements. Remember that the homework assignments due on Thursday. I think we've gone over the material that you need to solve those problems, but uh, feel free and let me know if you've got any questions during my office hours, and I'll see you then.